on the subject of resisting temptation. We went through and we said, number one, the way that we resist temptation is through regeneration, through being born again. If, if you're not born again, there's really no hope of you resisting temptation. Uh, regeneration must take place, first and foremost. I mean, you can, through self-discipline, try to modify your behavior in certain ways, but there's really no true change. You're still bound to the same pride and to the same uh, selfishness. We said, secondly, how do you resist temptation? Through God's Word. God's Word contains the life and the power of God, and it will set you free from those strongholds of the mind, from those demonic influences that are trying to hold you captive. We said, number three, we resist temptation through prayer. Prayer is that channel through which God can flow and impart his life and power to you. As we see uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we saw him being strengthened by the angel. That strength is available to you and me to resist temptation. Remember we said there's really no reason to cave into temptation except for what? One thing, if we fail to prepare. And then fourth, we must live a life and we must have a heart of denying self. And that mindset makes it much easier when you're faced with temptation because you recognize, I've already made this decision. I have already decided to serve Jesus and not serve myself. So I really don't have to deliberate too much about this temptation that's enticing me. The decision was already made when I decided to serve Jesus. And so that kind of a mindset and awareness of the commitment that each one of us have made to Christ really helps in the times of those struggles. And then this morning, we were talking about boundaries. And boy, I'm going to try to put this in just a thumbnail sketch very closely, very, uh, very quickly. Boundaries are very important. We said that boundaries, they are the strategic decisions that you make in advance of the confrontation that you know is coming with temptation. Remember what God warned Cain about. He said, sin is crouching at the door. And so sin is crouching at your door. And every time you turn on the TV, every time you go to work, every time you go to the mall, every time you, uh, you go on the internet, sin is waiting for you. Have you all found that out yet? And when you go, it's waiting to pounce, and it's waiting for just the right moment in just the right circumstances to pounce and to and entice you into sin. So you and I have to be prepared. And just like we were talking about this morning about, you know, the crisis management and the emergency response teams, they, uh, when that emergency happens, when they're confronted with that situation, they don't think, they just let their training take, so, take over. Those are the type of decisions that we're talking about here. Okay, for guys, just to cite a couple of examples that we were talking about this morning, you know, guys, you don't go down the magazine counter in the store because you know what's on the cover of those magazines. And you know that that image can lead to other images that can lead to pornography on the Internet that can just lead us deeper into sin. So what do we do? We go down other aisles that are not filled with that kind of temptation. Okay. We, and that's just an example of certain boundaries that we put into our life proactively so that we don't put ourselves in that position in the first place. We, uh, we talked a little bit about this morning that boundaries are not legalism. Okay, A boundary can become legalis, legalism if you're saying, I'm doing this so that God loves me more. I'm doing this to earn God's love. Or I'm doing this, by doing this, this will make me a big, better Christian. Okay, That's all legalism, what I just said. But boundaries are not legalism when you're doing it with the right heart motive. And we said that the proper heart motive we saw comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. The proper heart motive is, I love God, and I don't want anything to compromise or spoil my communion with him. I don't want to lose him. I don't want to lose his presence. I don't want to lose the nearness and the closeness of that communion with him. And so I'm going to take proactive steps and put certain boundaries in order to protect me, to protect that 
uh, to protect that communion and relationship, much like you protect your marriage, okay? Guys or ladies nowadays, uh, guys and ladies, what, what do you do if you're, if you're a, approached by someone at work and they're trying to flirt or come on to you or make advances towards you? You know you've got to immediately vacate the area, right? You can't stay in that situation. You cannot flirt with it. You cannot entertain it, not even for a moment. If you know that a certain person <clears throat> seems to have you as their target, then I'm not going to go anywhere near their cube. I'm not going to go any, anywhere near their break room. I'm going to take the precautions that I need. I, I'll go park in the other parking lot if I have to. But I'm going to make sure that I put the proper boundaries in place to where I'm being smart. I don't think I'm greater than the temptation. Christ in me is greater than the temptation. But I'm not even going to compromise or jeopardize uh, my relationship with the Lord in any way. I don't want to take any chances. Very much like you would protect your marriage. I'm going to protect this relationship with my Heavenly Father. These boundaries have got to be in place. Because if these boundaries are not in place, not legalism, but boundaries. If these boundaries are not in place, Satan is crouching at the door. And he knows exactly how to pounce and when to pounce. So guys, girls, ladies, don't be stupid. Let's put these boundaries in place. Uh, again, I'm just rushing through this. We talked this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse uh, 16 and 17, about how when we know the preciousness of God dwelling among us and walking among us, we want to be separate. We don't want to touch the unclean thing. We want to make sure that we have these boundaries in place. Thank you, Tommy. All right, we said decisions, boundaries are decisions made in advance of temptation to prevent being overcome in the impassioned moment of temptation. You know what happens when that temptation comes on and your passions start to kick into gear? If at that moment you have to deliberate, you've probably already lost. So that's when the decision, the commitment that you've made prior must be stronger than the emotion of the moment. And that's what the boundary is all about. I won't let this happen. I'll do this. I'll go there instead of here. I'll make the, whatever provision I need to to keep my heart and my relationship with God safe. Remember Proverbs 22, verse 3. The prudent sees danger and he does what? He hides himself. But the simple go on and they do what? They, they suffer for it. So whatever you have to do. Uh, this is where James really comes in handy. Very valuable where it says to confess your sins one to another. And uh, pray for one another that you might be healed. You know, one of the greatest, one of the greatest uh, tools that we have against temptation is each other. And, you know, many times in ourselves, we struggle and struggle and fight with a lust or a temptation. And if we just went and confided in a trusted friend and asked them to hold us accountable and asked them to pray for us, uh, the, the, it takes all the mystique away. It takes all the darkness away. We, we would have been healed right then and there just by that confession. And you know what? Nobody in this room is going to think any less of you. We've all been there. We know what it's like. Uh, we talked about, you know, Jesus, the aspect that he brought. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. If your eye offends you, I like this one. If your eye causes you to sin, do what? Tear it out. Doesn't that just create all sorts of nice imagery in your mind? Tear it out. Throw it away. And you think, uh, wow, what are you saying, Jesus? This is how serious Jesus is about this. This is how serious Jesus is about sin. This is how serious Jesus is about resisting temptation. You've got to do whatever it costs, whatever it takes, to make sure that you're prepared to win over temptation. And whatever it is in your life, get rid of it if it's a temptation, if it's leading you down the wrong path. And it all comes down to this question, it's better for you to enter into life with one eye than with two eyes. So it all comes down to that one question, how important is God to you? How precious is he? Do you really want to spoil and compromise your relationship with him 
by doing something foolish. We talked about all this this morning. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, that's a real good reminder. Just realizing, because I, I didn't cover it before in the review, but you know, we talked this morning about the fact that sometimes our mind will deceive us into thinking, well, you know, what I'm doing is not sin. What I'm doing is not wrong. Uh, but yeah, but what will it lead to? What will it build up to? Is, is this taking me closer to Jesus, or is this taking me away from Jesus? And we talked this morning about the fact that, you know, maybe that first drink of alcohol isn't sin, but the first leads to the fourth. That is sin. But you'll never get to the fourth if you never take the first. So it's that type of a thing of, you know, maybe sitting down and watching this TV movie is not sin, but the thoughts and the imagery that that movie plants in your mind, where is that going to take you? Is that going to lead you into sin? And if you decide, yes, it will lead my thought process down the wrong path, are you willing to cut it out of your life for Jesus? Because we know if you sow the seed, the seed's going to grow up and produce fruit. We talked about these passages quite a bit. Don't want to get back into this again. I really want to get into uh, 2 Peter. We talked about firm boundaries that we as Christians, we as the church need to set. We said, number one, there needs to be firm boundaries about the Ten Commandments. You know, you think of that and you think, well, duh. You know, idolatry, murder, adultery, theft, lying, covetousness. Uh, Ephesians says, these things must not even be named among you, not even once. So those are very hard set boundaries for us. Anything that's illicit, immoral, or illegal. Uh, we talked this morning about the fact that, you know, throughout the ages, people in Christendom have thought, well, I'm not of this world, so I don't have to obey the, the laws of this world. Uh, that doesn't work. You, we have to obey the laws of the land. Paul told Timothy, remind them to be submissive to rulers and to authorities. Now, when that ruler or that authority tells you to bow down and worship this uh, this golden statue, that's another thing. We don't do that. We don't go there. But as, as much as is possible, we re remain submissive and obedient to the laws of the land. Firm boundaries need to be set in addictive type sins, such as drugs, alcohol, pornography, violence. Uh, those things, those things that produce addiction, boy, we need to just be smart and stay away. Why even entertain it? Why even flirt with it? Why even have that one drink when it's going to lead to four? Just how much do you love Jesus? Is he worth it to you? How precious is he to you? We talked this morning about alliances with the world system. Uh, the scriptures are very clear about that in Numbers 33. If you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land, then what you allow to remain in your life will be barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. It will come back to haunt you. And it will create trouble for you. You know, one, one of the classic examples is Abraham and Hagar. Was that the wrong decision or what? You know? Yeah, Sarah told him to do it. But boy, that had to be a decision that he regretted the rest of his life. Look what trouble it caused his household. And that is what happens when you don't establish these boundaries of, yes, I will do this, and no, I won't do that. Uh, we talked about relationships with the opposite sex and how uh, Paul was admonishing Timothy, this young man, you treat women in the church, and really all women, in all purity as sisters. You know, we talked this morning about your natural sister, if you look at another woman as if she's your natural sister, uh, most of us, hopefully all of us, would never even dream of having any type of a sexual or romantic relationship with our sister. We don't even see them in that way. In fact, you kind of go, ooh, yuck, when you think of it, right? That's the way you're supposed to treat women in the church. So there's supposed to be, guys, there's supposed to be an innocence, there's supposed to be a purity, in the way that you treat women in the church and in the world. And uh, for all of us, guys and girls both, 
you have to be careful with how you relate to them. You know, you don't, uh, you know, if, if you have a, if you're a man and you have a, I don't, don't want to say a man friend, that doesn't sound quite right somehow, but, you know, if you have a friend who's of the same sex, and uh, sure, you can, you can, uh, there can be some emotional attachment there, but there should never be an emotional attachment um, that's anything romantic in nature between opposite sexes who are not married. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. I mean, we love each other. We care for each other. Uh, when a brother or sister hurts, we hurt with them. I'm not talking about that. But there's never anything of any sexual or romantic uh, type of um, sense in the relationship. We, we keep it pure. And so we talked a little bit this morning, you know, about you want to be careful not to have private or personal conversations. And for our technology today, instant messaging, text messaging, we need to be careful with that. Uh, you know, communication that's not monitored can be very dangerous between opposite sexes. It can get off track quickly. It's best not just to not even do it. Uh, personal phone calls, it's best not to do it. Uh, do it with your wife or your husband involved in the conversation, okay? But when, it, when the conversation or when the relationship starts to turn personal or emotional in nature, you're headed for trouble. You better stop it quick, and you better make sure this is, this is an area where you need to have really clear-cut boundaries because when certain emotions kick in, you're not thinking clearly anymore. So you have to have real clear boundaries from the beginning not to even go there in the first place. All right? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Talking about Lot and how he became vexed by this world system. And how he became vexed. Why? Because he didn't have some of these boundaries in place. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, God condemned them to extinction making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. That torment to the righteous soul. Have you ever been involved in sin in your life and... It seemed to have a hold on your heart and you were trying to get free, but you couldn't get free and you come into a worship service in church and you're just miserable because you've got all this, all this conflict going on in your heart. You've got guilt, you know, you know you're not right with the Lord, but that you love him and you want to worship him and you just have this whole internal battle going on inside of your heart and then compare that to other times when you've been free and yeah, you might fall and sin every now and then, but there's no uh, continuing sin in your life. You're just free to worship the Lord and how peaceful and refreshing and joyful it is. You all know the difference. That's what it's talking about here when it's talking about Lot was tormenting his righteous soul. When you're not free from temptation, when you're not free from sin, when it has any type of a hook or hold in your heart, you are miserable. And it's just tormenting you with the guilt and the condemnation. He was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he what? Saw and heard. And so I put here these four things, and we'll stop with this, but I think this is really important for us to recognize in ourselves. How do you know when you're being vexed, as it says Lot was? How do you know when you're losing the battle against temptation? How do you know when... Temptation is getting its hooks into your heart and those strongholds are being established in your mind and in your heart. Number one, you identify with the world. You know, it says there that Lot was living among them. And you, and you really, you lose the distinction between you and the sinner. And you start to think like they think and uh, feel what they feel and... The, 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 the distinction between light and darkness, righteousness and sin becomes blurred and gray. And boy, that's a miserable place to be in. 
We are not of this world. We're not of the kingdom of darkness. We're of the kingdom of light. And every day that you live on this earth, you should realize I'm different. I'm not of this place. This place operates by a completely different set of rules than what I'm used to but by what I live by. I live by the kingdom of God. I live by the kingdom of light. And so one of the ways that you know that temptation is gaining ground on you and you're losing the battle is when you begin to identify with them. You feel a part of them. You feel like you can relate to them. You feel like there's common ground with the sinner. There's always compassion and sympathy, and there is common ground in, in that you understand where they're coming from because you were there. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about relating to them in the sense of now you're living according to the passions of your flesh just like they are. There shouldn't be any of that identification. Secondly, fatigue. One of the, one of the main problems in Lot was that he lived among them how? Day after day. And this is a huge subject, and I don't have time to develop it properly, but we have got to make sure that our spirits are staying refreshed. We've got to make sure that our life priorities are proper. Remember, I've mentioned before and haven't really talked about it that much, but basically we're in three places. We're either at home or at work or at church. And some of you, you may have some more places you hang out, I don't know, that doesn't matter. But you've got to make sure that balance is proper. You've got to make sure that uh, you're getting the rest that you need, that you're eating healthy, that you're getting the sleep that you need, that you're getting uh, the intimate time with your spouse that you need. And you, it, it's tough sometimes, isn't it, managing all of these priorities? You've got to make sure that you're in church and, and having relationships with brothers and sisters like you should. But when, when those priorities and when those life balances start to get out of order, man, you're setting yourself up to be snared by the devil. And pretty soon you start losing some of that intimate time with your wife and some of the ladies at work start to look pretty good, right? You all know what I'm talking about. You start to lose relationships with, uh, don't laugh too loud, Kevin. You're <laughs> Kevin could really identify with that one, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You want to make me laugh here. <laughs> we need about 100 people in this room, so Kevin, that wasn't such a public moment for Kevin. But anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, for those of you in Skype land, Kevin really identified with what I was talking about there. I don't know why, I, but anyway. <laughs> but you know, when you lose that intimacy with your father, you know, we've all been there, you know. Kevin's not the only one, unfortunately. We have all been there, you know. Uh, wives, you know, you lose some of that intimate talk time that you need with your husbands. And, uh, you know, someone else, I, I mean, I don't know. The bad guy at the grocery store or the gardener comes along and you have a nice conversation with him and ladies, you start to think, wow, you know, he might actually listen to me, unlike my husband, right? And uh, all of those thoughts start to kick in. You all know what I'm talking about. So when we talk about fatigue, we're, we're talking about those times when the life balance gets out of order and we're not getting the rest that we need, we're not spending time with our spouses like we need, we're not spending time with God like we need. We're not spending time in church like we need. And it gets tough juggling all of those life balances, but boy, when they get out of balance, Satan has a lot he can work with, believe me. So, and that's something that I've tried to share here. Uh, you know how we operate. We're not keeping attendance. And, and uh, when you say, hey, I just need to take some time off, you take the time off. We trust you. We know, you know what's going on in your life, and, uh, and we respect that. So we don't have any type of mandatory attendance, and you've got to be here every time we're here. There's none of that. 
okay? So you've got to work all of these priorities out in your own life between you and God. And really, nobody else, no other man can step in and do that for you. You've got to do it, all right? The agitation part. You know, the agitation of daily seeing and hearing. And, and boy, through the internet, through TV, through radio, through work, just through working in this crummy world, Every day, our spirits are being agitated by the evil that's all around us. And that agitation is working against our pursuit of God. And so we really have to be careful with that and stay spiritually refreshed and spiritually on top of it. Because it can, that agitation can run away real quick. And we end up uh, making some very foolish decisions. And then the sensory perception of what, you know, of what Lot saw and heard... You've got to, uh, you really have to put a guard over your eyes and over your ears. And uh, I know Terry and I, you've probably done the same thing. There's been movies. You pay all the bucks for to see this movie and you get up and walk out because it turned out to be something worse than you thought it was. And you didn't know that was going to be a part of it. You don't have to sit there and, and take that and listen to the whole thing. Uh, if it gets too much, uh, walk out, turn the channel, do something. But that sensory perception is something, uh, once that's in your brain, man, it's in there. So don't even let it in in the first place. All right, so boy, I, I don't know if you got anything out of that tonight or not. Uh, I was going to go through Genesis 19, we won't. But Genesis 19, as you read through the story, this is the story of a man who was vexed with temptation and losing the battle. And just to show you how bad it can get, remember when the men of the city surrounded his house and were getting ready to break down the door because they wanted to have sexual relations with the angels, and what does Lot do? He offers up his virgin daughters. I mean, you scum bucket, what are you doing? That There's no excuse for a father to do that to his daughters, right? But see, that's, that's, that's where temptation will take you. That's where vexation will take you if you are not prepared to battle against it. Through these means, through regeneration, through the word, through prayer, through self-denial. Let's pray. Let's end there. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And Father, in the story of Lot, we see the seriousness and what it could cost us if we don't win the battle against temptation. And so, Father, we ask that you would teach our hands to make war. Father, we ask that you would teach us how to establish boundaries in our life to where we come out and we are separate and we touch not the unclean thing and we draw the line in the sand and say, the world can come no further. This is what I believe. This is uh, what I live and die for. This is my faith. And this is what uh, makes the decisions of how I conduct my behavior. And I'm not budging. Father, give us that conviction of heart. It's not legalism. We're not doing this to try to earn God's love. But we are doing this to preserve the integrity and the purity of our relationship with God. And so, Father, we ask that you teach us how to make war, how to establish the boundaries that we need for ourselves and our own personal life. We pray that you would give us the wisdom how to balance life priorities so that we're spending, first and foremost, enough time with you, intimately, privately, so that we're spending enough time with our spouse, intimately, privately, that we're spending the time that we need at church with other believers being edified and built up into the image of Jesus. Father, help us to set these boundaries. And now as we go, we just pray that you would protect us, guide us. Father, I pray for your peace to be upon every heart and every home that's here tonight. Bring us back safely again Thursday to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.